The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Hazmat Series Part 7, Hazmat Material Table and Language, brought to you by the Shortline Safety Institute and the American Shortline and Regional Railroad Association. My name is Sabrina Weiss, and I'm the Vice President of Education and Business Services for the Association. And before we begin, I want to let everyone know that we are recording this webinar and we will make the recording available to participants so you may go back and review anything we discussed today. To ensure quality audio for the recording, all attendees are on mute and you will only be able to hear our presenter speaking. If you have questions during the presentation, you may type them into the questions bar on your screen and we will read through all submitted questions at the end of the webinar. I would like to thank today's speaker, um, Mr. Dave Buckalo. Dave is recently retired, but he agreed to come back and present uh, this webinar for us because uh, he is an expert on so many railroad related subjects. Um, Dave is on the line with me now, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him to get us started. Welcome, Dave. Good morning, or I guess good afternoon. I'm in California, so it's still morning here. But uh, good morning, and uh, Hopefully we can uh, impart some more information to you on the hazmat uh, material table. And next slide. The hazardous material table is where you would go to determine uh, the names, the proper placarding, any uh, special provisions, packaging, quantity limitations, and uh, label codes for hazardous materials. Next slide. Um, this module will help you identify information about a particular hazardous material such as a hazard class or division, the ID number, the packing group, any label codes, special and special provisions. Um, and uh, any time that you accept a hazardous material shipment, you must know that it is all spelled right and uh, that it's properly placarded and properly classified. Next slide. Uh, the hazardous material table lists alphabetically by proper shipping needs those materials the U.S. Department of Transportation has it designated as hazardous materials for the purpose of transportation. This table provides the required information used on the shipping papers, package marking and labeling, and prescribes quantity limits on aircraft and rail cars. And uh, since we don't have aircraft or rail cars or vessels, um, we don't have to worry about those sections. The module assumes that the manufacturer or shipper has already identified the hazardous material correctly. You're just going to go back in and make sure it's the correct product. Spelling is very important with uh, each of the products. Next slide, please. The HMT applicability, uh, hazardous materials regulations, the HMP apply to at least three separate groups of people. They include each person who offers a hazardous material for transportation, which is in most cases the shipper. Each carrier by rail, which is us who transports the hazardous material. A person other than the one mentioned who performs a function related to proper provision or proper use of hazmat packaging. So it could be one of our transloaders or somebody transloading into rail cars. Next slide, please. The HMT is located in 49 CFR 172.101. It contains more than 3,000 proper shipping names of substances most commonly shipped or carried as hazardous material. The HMT specifies the reference or references requirements to labeling, packaging, quantity limits, uh, and the proper shipping name, the hazard class, identification number, and packing group. The table contains 14 columns and 10 major headings numbered one through 10. Next slide. Columns one to five of the materials table contain the information required for the basic description that is a key part of the shipping paper. The table covers the transportation of hazardous materials in all modes. It provides the proper shipping name of the material or directs the user to the preferred proper shipping name. So if we just look at the first uh, entry in the column under column number two, acetaldehyde, 
It's a Hazard Class Division Three, and its UN number is 1089. So we can see all that. So if a shipper offers that up to you, you can double check to be sure they properly got it spelled. They have the right hazard class or division and the identification number and the packing group, which it shows in column five as one. Next slide, please. Column one is labeled symbols and will contain one of six symbols. These symbols designate groups of hazardous materials with specific transportation requirements. Those six symbols are a plus, A, D, G, I, or W. Next slide. The plus sign fixes the proper shipping name, hazard class, and packing group for that entry listed in columns two and three, respectfully. Fixes means you may not change the proper shipping name, hazard class, or packing group, even if the materials do not meet the hazard class definition when the plus sign is assigned to the proper shipping name in column one. It means the materials known to pose a risk to humans. Next slide, please. The A only means by air. Next slide, please. The D identifies hazardous materials for the purpose of domestic transportation. A separate entry may identify the same hazardous material on a ship international. Next slide, please. The G indicates NOS, not otherwise specified. In a generic shipping and a generic proper shipping name for which one or more technical names of the hazardous material must be entered in parentheses in association with the basic description. So they might show articles, explosive, NOS, and then they might add that it's fireworks in that case, and then the hazard class or division in column three. Next slide, please. The I identifies hazardous materials purpose, uh, for the purposes of international transportation. An alternate entry may appear as the same hazardous material when only domestic transportation is involved. In some cases, different countries require different uh, hazard placking, placarding or information. And uh, next slide, please. And the W means the entry applies only when the materials transported are offered by vessel, uh, unless it's a hazardous waste or hazardous substances. Next slide, please. Multiple symbols. Notice that ammonium nitrate-based fertilizer is an AW in the one of the HMT. AW means the entry applies to air and water transportation only. Next slide. Column two is the hazardous materials descriptions and proper shipping names. Column two is labeled as such. It lists the proper shipping name of each hazardous material in the table along with any accompanying descriptive information. Proping, proper shipping names are limited to those in Roman type, not italics. Proper shipping names are written in Roman type only. Names in italics may not be used to describe the hazardous material. So if you look at the aerosol flammable NOS and then see it's italicized uh, that's not the proper shipping name it's the arables or aerosols flammable NOS next slide and if we then look again at uh, the table aerosols non-flammable, each not exceeding one liter, which we wouldn't have. We'd have a lot more of that in any car. The proper shipping name may be used in the singular or plural form in either capital or lowercase letters. This example displays the plural form aerosols in both upper and lower case, but aerosol is the singular form of aerosol in lower case, or aerosol in all uppercase letters would be acceptable. Next slide. This column two, it lists proper shipping names of each hazardous material table along with any accompanying descriptive information. 
Proper shipping names and linen is those shown in Roman type. Proper shipping names are written in Roman type. Names in italics may not be used again. Punctuation marks and words in italics are not part of the shipping name, but may be used in addition to the proper shipping name. The word or in italics indicates that terms and sequence may be used as a proper shipping name is appropriate. So if we look at um, the table again, carbon dioxide, refrigerated liquid, we may have that on our railroads. Um, but the next one down, carbon dioxide, solid or dry ice, we probably do not have on our railroads. So just looking at the shipping name, that's how you would want to see carbon dioxide, refrigerated liquid, as there are 10 cars with that that are shipped. And next slide. Column two is labeled as hazardous material descriptions. It lists the proper shipping name again of each hazardous materials. And if you notice on the slide, uh, we've got some toxic liquids, corrosive, organic, NOS, inhalation hazard, packing group one, zone A. That is actually the description. There is no italicized ones there, and it tells you what it is. And then again, in column three, it gives you the hazard class or division. The word poison or poisonous may be used interchangeably with the word toxic when domestic transportation is involved. Using the example toxic liquids, corrosive NOS, inhalation hazard, packing group one, zone A, the word poisonous could be interchanged with the word toxic only on a domestic shipment. So if you are shipping internationally, you would have to uh, have the word toxic in place of poisonous. And next slide. The proper shipping names are limited to those shown in the Roman type again. And um, we've got one that says paint related material, including paint thinning, drying, removing, or reducing compounds. So we can have a paint thinner, and then we normally would not see that again in rail transportation, but it is a hazard class three. Next slide. And here's one that we would see um, as a um, on the railroad, ethyl alcohol, ethyl, ethanol or ethyl alcohol or ethanol solutions or ethyl alcohol solutions. And as you can see, they're, they're saying look up ethanol in, in the tape. So they may have that on there and then see ethanol, but in most cases you're going to see ethanol or ethyl alcohol or ethanol solutions or ethyl alcohol solutions. And next slide. While column two lists the proper shipping name of each hazard material, there are some entries that receive special consideration with regards to proper shipping names allowed and required to be used on package marketing and shipper descriptions. Um, so they may show hydrogen peroxide aqueous solutions with more than 40%, but not more than 60% hydrogen peroxide. So different solutions you will see this with acid and uh, with some of the uh, peroxides and with some of the uh, fertilizers as to what the solutions are. Next slide, please. There are some entries that receive special consideration with the regards to proper shipping names line and required to be used on packaging and marking. When proper shipping name includes concentration range, the actual concentration, if it is within the range data, may be placed used in place of the concentration range. For example, aqueous solution of hydrogen peroxide containing 30% peroxide may be described as hydrogen peroxide aqueous in, in that column. So you can either use the actual amount or the shipping range. Next slide. The use of the prefix mono is optional in any shipping name when appropriate. In an example below, iodine monochloride may be used interchangeably with iodine chloride. And glycerol alpha monochlorohydrin may be interchangeably used with glycerol alpha chlorohydrin since the term mono is considered to be a prefix to the term 
chlorohydrin and may be deleted. So you may see it shown in both ways. Next slide. The word liquid or solid may be added to the proper shipping name and hazardous materially specific listed by name. May due to the different physical states be a liquid or a solid. An example might be a material normally found in a dry solid state, but when mixed with liquid like water would be present in a liquid state. There are two examples shown here for protonic acid, one in a liquid state and the other in a solid state. Next slide. If the word waste is not included in the hazardous materials description in column two, the proper shipping name for the hazardous waste shall include the word waste preceding the proper shipping name of the material. An example might be a container of acetone that has been contaminated with small quantities or another material. When the container is marked and prepared for disposal, the shipping paper entry looks like waste acetone and not simply acetone. The word waste need not precede a shipping name that already includes waste. Uh, some railroads do handle mixed hazardous wastes, which would contain some of these other products, and um, so they will always show that it is a hazardous waste or a waste. Next slide. A mixture or solution not supposed to be identified in my name comprised of hazardous material identified in the table by a technical name or non hazardous material shall be described using the proper shipping name of the hazardous material and the qualifying word mixture or solution would be added unless an exception is met per the regulations. The example shown here is for acetone, a hazardous material, plus water, a non-hazardous material. In addition to the non-hazardous product, water does not change the hazard class or division or the properties of acetone. The proper shipping names become acetone mixture or acetone solution. Next slide. There are some inter uh, there we go. A number of abbreviations are interchangeable. For example, NOS, NOI, NOI, EN, all have the same meaning. These abbreviations may be capitalized or written in lowercase letters. Each of these phrases is interchangeable with the others and is acceptable for use on package marking and shipping papers. The HMT most frequently uses the abbreviation of NOS to cover materials not otherwise specified. I have hardly ever seen any of those others except in less than, than rail quantities, I can say small packages. Uh, next slide. Proper shipping name, yes or no? Is, the, is this the proper shipping name? Take a look at the shipper's name on the bill lading. Is flammable liquids NOS a proper shipping name according to the HMT? So, flammable liquids NOS is a proper shipping name, and you can compare that with what your shippers give you. Next slide. The hazard class or division is going to be your uh, entry for the proper shipping name or the word forbidden. That means it can't be shipped. Select each of these buttons to learn more about the five types of cases, and we're not going to do that today. But um, you can see where the proper hazard class is. That would be the class or division. In this case, acetaldehyde 3 is a flammable liquid. Next slide. Column 3 is a hazard class or division and includes a designation of class or hazard division corresponding to each shipping name or the word forbidden. The table contains lists 173.2 lists the class numbers, division numbers, or class and division names in those sections of the subchapter that contain the definitions for classifying hazardous materials. The normal entries include those that contain a class number from 1 through 9 or a division number 1.1 through 6.2. Next slide. A material for which the entry in this column is forbidden may not be offered for transportation or transported. 
This provision does not apply if the material is diluted, stabilized, or incorporated into the device and it is classified in accordance with the definition of hazardous materials contained in Part 173 of the HMR. I, again, have not seen any clippers that offer any forbidden products. Next slide. A material for which in the infant column is ORMD means a material such as consumer commodity, which although otherwise subject to the regulations of Part 173, presents a limited hazard during transportation due to its form, quantity, and packaging. Consumer quantities have a hazard class or division entries of ORMD or ORMD error. This would mostly be found in intermodal shipments with an example of uh, ORMDs would be um, spray paint and things like that that are in containers that are um, or or bug killer that you send to Walmart and things like that. So it's a uh, it's unless you're handling intermodal, you probably won't see these, and that would probably be the intermodal uh, trucking company or intermodal company would provide you with the proper. Um, shipping papers, and the manifest for the trailer or container. Next slide. When I reevaluate, sorry. Okay, we're just going to skip this slide and go to the next one. When an entry reference is a class D material, each reference to a class D material is modified to read combustible liquid when the material is reclassified in accordance with 173. 150 or has a flash point above 65 degrees centigrade or 141 degrees, but below 93C or 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So combustible liquids like diesel fuel um, and other combustibles, um, they're going to have a a placard identification of UN 1993 or NA 1993 with a packing group of three. Next slide. Column four is your identification numbers. Those are the UN or NA numbers. And anything with an NA is only recognized for domestic transportation center and no longer required recognize the NA. And I have not seen very NA yet, very many NA placards left anymore. I don't think that they're, they're being used much. Next slide. Um, domestic and international shipments, the UN plus four digit ID number used for domestic and international shipments. And we'll go to the next slide. The packing group, packing group one indicates the greatest level of danger, two, medium level of danger, and three, a minor, minor level of danger. Next slide. Packing group numbers must be indicated in Roman numerals on the shipping papers when applicable may be preceded by the letters PG. There are no packing group designated for materials in these groups. Class two, compressed gas. Class three, radioactive materials. Division 6.2, other medical waste and ORMD materials. Next slide. So if we look at a shipping paper here, we do have a shipping paper that has the basic description, the proper shipping name, the hazard class or division, the identification number, and the packing group. Next page, or slide, I'm sorry. There's the proper shipping name. Next slide. The hazard class or division number. Next slide. The identification number. Next slide and the packing group. And these are all taken uh, from column five of the HMT. Next slide.
Column 6 through 10 of the hazardous material table contains specialized inform information necessary for packaging, marking, labeling, and flacking, and other shipping mode specific requirements. The table covers transportation of hazardous material in all modes. Next slide. The label codes. So if you look at label codes, and we have two placards here. Um, three is flammable liquids, 4.1 flammable solids. If you notice that uh, the fours have different uh, label codes, and uh, the sixes also do. And next slide. Column 7 is labeled special provisions and specifies codes for provisions applicable to hazardous materials. These provisions are in addition to the standard requirements. Next slide. And we're concerned with uh, the R. So anything that would be in the R column and also transported in bulk packaging, non bulk packaging, T for intermodal portable tanks, or TP portable tanks that would be applicable on the railroad. Next slide. Column 8 is um, specific packaging and labeling requirements. Uh, 8C list packaging sections that must be used to prepare hazardous materials for bulk shipments. Next slide. The section site under column 8A, 8B, or 8C are located in part 173 using just like an example. The number 150 in column A indicates the packaging section allowed for gasoline to found in 173, 150, so that's where you would have to go. The number 202 in column 8B indicates that the bulk non-packaging requirements for gasoline are found in 173, 202, and the number 242 in column 8C indicates bulk packaging requirements are found in 173, 242. When the packaging reference is not applicable to the state, solid or liquid or materials being transported Use the solid and liquid tables to determine the correct packaging requirements. Again, our packaging is either going to be a tank car or an intermodal tank or possibly an intermodal container. Next slide. And we're going to skip this because it uh, we don't well I don't think any of our passenger rail carrying rail cars. Um, we're carrying any uh, of the hazardous material on any line, so we'll skip this column nine limited quantities and go to the next slide. Categories of hazardous substances, as you can see, it just shows the reportable quantities that and these are the if something leaks or gets out of the car is the quantity that needs to be reported under federal regulations only. Many of the states you operate in have much lower requirements if it is a reportable quantity. Or in the case of California, anything that spills, including milk, is a reportable substance. So you have to look at your state rules to see what's reportable if you have an incident. Next slide. And this is for um, radionuclides. And again, we don't ship much radioactive material or reportable quantities for that. Next slide, please. Have to determine if the materials are hazardous substances. Substance, you must use Table One and Two, Appendix A of the HMT, to determine whether a particular package of hazardous material is regulated as a hazardous material. What is a specific name? Is the material listed as a hazardous substance in either Table 1 or 2 to the Appendix A? What is the RQ for the materials listed? Does the amount of hazardous substance contained in one package meet or exceed the RQ for the substance? Is a hazardous substance named found in the HMT 
and thus a proper shipping name. So if you had something new come on your railroad that you weren't sure about and whether it was a hazardous substance or not, when it was offered for shipment by the shipper, you can go to these tables and determine whether it's hazardous or not and assist your shipper if you need to. Next slide. If a hazardous substance is not a proper shipping name, if a hazardous substance is not listed as a proper shipping name in the HMT, use environmentally hazardous substance, NOS liquid, or environmentally hazardous substance, and substance NOS solid is appropriate. Again, this would be for the shipper and not for the railroad, as you normally are not preparing the uh, actual shipping papers. Next sentence, or next slide, I'm sorry. Determining whether hazardous substance is regulated in transportation, you can look at the ethylene dichloride in portable quantities, 100 pounds, packet size, in case in this size it's tank cut, 5,500 pounds in one package. The material listed in Appendix A does the amount equal or exceed the RQ for ethylene dichloride. It is a hazardous substance, and then it's ethylene dichloride. Next slide. Marine pollutants requirements specified within the HMR apply to all marine pollutants shipped by vessel, but do not apply to non-bulk shipments transported by air, rail, or highway. And that's changed a little bit, and we now do have marine pollutant placards that will go on some cars that are uh, transported as marine pollutants on the railroad. So next slide. And the next slide, please, we'll skip this one. And we're down to any questions. Excellent. Great. Thank you, Dave. That was a very thorough presentation. I'll just remind folks that if you have questions for Dave, um, you can go ahead and type them into the questions bar on your screen here, and I will read them out. So I'll give folks a couple of minutes to do that. Um, one question that we always get, Dave, is can we get a copy of the presentation? So um, I'll remind folks that we did, we have, we are recording this webinar, and we will post the recording on the Shortline Safety Institute website. So you can go there um, to access it in the next couple of days. We will also send a link out to all of our participants today so that you'll have a, a, the link by email if you want to go back and, and access the recording. Um, Dave, can we make this presentation available to folks or is this something um, that if they have questions they should contact you directly? No, that can be available to the folks and I want to let them know this is a good training module to use for uh, your office forces, clerical forces, uh, this wouldn't really be directed toward your train crews, but this is one of the modules that you can use for training your uh, your clerical forces, the people that prepare the ship, the, uh, the the train list, and all that. This is a good one, or take in the bills of lading and prepare the way bills, and then it'll meet part of your your required hazmat training every three years. This is one of the good modules for that. Great, that's really helpful. Um, this 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 is probably one of the most more, most boring sections of, of hazardous materials in, in in reading that table. And everyone should have a copy of the, uh, the CFR containing all these, uh, you know, in your office in a hard copy. At times, the FRA will come in and request to see that you have a copy of the CFR. Uh, there are some electronic versions of it, um, but it's, it's nice to have it readily available for your folks there in the office to look things up. Great, okay. Um, so again, I'll, when we send the link out to the recorded webinar, we'll include a copy of the presentation in a PDF format, um, and we'll, we will go ahead and post a copy of the presentation on the website as well, along with the link. So if folks wanna go back and um, view this again, or if you want to share it with any of your colleagues, um, have them take a look at it, um, it's available for, for future use. Um, 
I don't have any questions coming in at this point. I think this was pretty thorough and pretty comprehensive stuff, Dave. So um, I will remind folks that if, if you have questions for Dave, if you think of something later and you want to reach out to Dave directly, although he is retired, um, he, he has given us his email address and he's said that he's willing to, to answer questions if, if folks want to reach out to him. So his email address is up here on your screen. Um, if you have questions specifically about uh, Short Line Safety Institute webinars or, or the Institute itself, please feel free to contact Michelle Malski, uh, the Safety Program Manager for the Institute. Her email address and phone number are both up here on your screen. And then, of course, if you have questions about webinars in general um, with the association, please feel free to contact me, and, and mine's um, down there at the bottom. So. Um, if we don't have any other questions, I will thank you, Dave, very much for your time today and for doing the presentation. Do you have any final remarks for folks here? No, if you do email me, give me a day or two to respond to because now that I am retired, my wife has uh, found things for me to do and we have a camper, so we have been going camping and at that point. I don't always answer my emails Excellent. for a day or two. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Dave. We do appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We hope this was uh, an informative, helpful webinar. Um, check our website uh, at um, aslrra.org under events for dates and times and titles of any upcoming webinars. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you all and have a great afternoon. Dave, thanks very much.